Good morning. I'm happy to be here, back from the grave. Uh, thank you very much. It's always nice to be part of humanity again. <laughs> but uh, today I'm here uh, still enjoying my medic partial medical leave um, to introduce our um, very own Judy Duncan, Dr. Judy Duncan. It gave me, it gave me great pleasure to introduce um, today, the lecturer, uh, Dr. Julie Duncan. I met uh, Dr. Duncan back in 1996, when she first came to Garrett. We connected immediately because we had many things in common. A similar uh, religious upbringing, our love for teaching, for poetry, and our personalities. We found it easy to talk, to share ideas and dreams. Uh, Julie was coming from Princeton, my alma mater, and that was another point of contact between the two of us. Soon we became not only colleagues but friends, and that friendship uh, has sustained us throughout all these years in which Garrett has gone through so many changes, both in terms of people but also in terms of uh, administrative designs that have forced uh, some of us to move out of our comfort zone as scholars and dedicate more time to things we never thought we have signed on when we were first hired. Dr. Duncan and I are some of the few die-hard people, or translated into dinosaurs, uh, who still remain from those earlier days before emails and the annoying Facebook. When it comes to Dr. Duncan's abilities and skills, it is very obvious that one of her most salient characteristics uh, is her teaching skills, as testified time and again by students. Students love Julie's classes. Uh, and why is it? Content? Yes, of course. But this content is filtered through her love for literature and the power of story in particular. About this, she says in, on the web, uh, quote, but my abiding fascination with the potency of story is a common thread in my research and teaching in the Old Testament. In the text of ancient Israel, one encounters a world where identity is formed, reformed, remembered, and cherished through the telling of stories. Teaching this text in the seminar classroom is an exciting and rejuvenating experience for me. We continue the dynamic process of telling and retelling, of discovering and rediscovering our identity in all its richness and complexity." End quote. But there's another reason, and perhaps the main reason, uh, why students love Julie's classes, and that is because of the way she treats students. When you engage in conversation with Dr. Duncan, there's a feeling of being accepted, both as a person and as a thinker. This the students perceive right away. No one's opinion is dismissed. No one is made to feel inferior or inadequate or stupid when asking a question or making a remark. This quality of hers is more than what we can say about some of our own teaching styles. This is something we can learn from her, not only because it benefits the students academically, but also, and especially, because it takes seriously the basic human feelings that we sometimes tend to overlook when engaged in furious academic debate. In terms of publications, uh, Dr. Duncan has made an important contribution to the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls with her work in volume nine of the series Discoveries in the Judean Desert, titled Qumran, K4, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and Kings, uh, published by Oxford University. This work constitutes what is called an editio princeps, that is the first printed edition of a work that previously had existed only in manuscript form. So you can see the importance of uh, her work. I'm not sure that too many of us knew about that. I know I didn't. 
Editio Princeps, first printed in English um, version of that manuscript. Apart from this important book, uh, Dr. Duncan <coughs> has also written a good number of essays, all of them uh, related to the Dead Sea Scrolls. The following stand out. Deuteronomy, Book of Deuteronomy, and the Encyclopedia of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Excerpts, accepted text of Deuteronomy at Qumran, Review de Qumran. Um, new readings for the blessings of Moses from Qumran in the Journal of Biblical Literature. Considerations of force gave Deuteronomy in light of all Saul's Deuteronomy and K4 phylactery text uh, published in the Proceedings of the International Congress on the Dead Sea Scrolls, Madrid. But Dr. Duncan has also a forthcoming book, and this is going to be a book on Ecclesiastes, the subject of today's lecture. And that is coming from Abindon Press. It is finished, but in production. A commentary designed for theology students and those in upper level college or university settings, as well as for pastors and other church leaders. Here's an excerpt from this up, uh, forthcoming book. Quote Hanright Ball writes that the artist carries death within him like a good priest his breviary. One might say this is the calling of the artist or poet. That is, to help us negotiate the truths of life that are too difficult, too terrifying to manage alone. Because we do not stop for death, the poet stops for us, so to speak, who, who, with arresting figurations of our mortality. Kohelet reminds us of <coughs> human limits at every turn, with the ultimate limit being that of death. Indeed, the note on which the book ends is a solemn reflection on death as the end of every one, end quote. Finally, <coughs> an ongoing project of hers is an essay in volume 6A of the Princeton Theological Seminary Dead Sea Scrolls project edited by James Charlesworth, the title of which is Targum and Job, Parabiblical and Related Documents. So here we have our very own Dr. Julie Duncan. Help me to welcome her to the podium. A few years ago, I wrote um, a colleague of mine who had published a lot in the wisdom literature. And uh, I wrote him several questions about the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, he wrote back and his first sentence was, I gather you're writing a commentary on Ecclesiastes. May I offer my condolences? <laughs> <laughs> the book defies the genre, he said. And it was not helpful when later I realized he was writing a commentary <laughs> on the book of Ecclesiastes. <laughs> but hopefully we can get through one lecture. <laughs> <clears throat> Ecclesiastes has been called the strangest book in the Bible. That may be one, of the, one thing most of its readers can agree on, for this small book has perhaps generated more widely differing interpretations than any other of the Bible. Its ability to disquiet and to generate controversy among its readers is glimpsed in its earliest interpretive history. Ancient rabbinic discussion preserves evidence of a debate about the status of Ecclesiastes as sacred scripture. As to the concerns involved, we would like to know more. There is just enough information to pique curiosity. For instance, there is a concern that its endorsement of pleasure might lead young men astray. Also interesting is the mention of internal contradictions in the book. And it is, in fact, this latter aspect of the book, its discordances, that has continued to occupy readers to this day. 
While this conversation includes discussion of specific contradictory themes, the central issue of debate is that of the book's overall tonality. <coughs> and interpretations cover a wide spectrum of positions, ranging from a message of thoroughgoing pessimism, in the words of one scholar, the book wafts the smell of the tomb, to one of optimism and a hearty affirmation of life. As to those readers of the book of Ecclesiastes who see in it a message of unrelieved pessimism, it is not hard to see why. Kohelet questions the meaning of so many of those experiences and endeavors in which people find value, work, personal achievement, fame, prosperity, Moreover, he challenges the very belief structures that underpin and give order to existence. There is no assured relationship between one's deeds and their consequences. We do not know what will happen in the future, much less control what befalls us. Nor can we discern a coherent design or pattern for what happens. God's actions are enigmatic, and God's will is inscrutable. For Co Kohelet, the one certainty in life is death. Now, if these were the only thematic elements in the book, there would be little dissent about its tonality. However, Kohelet punctuates these probing critiques with a series of affirmations of enjoyment enjoyment of elemental pleasures, food, drink, work, companionship. Occurring seven times in the book, they are noteworthy for their commonality of language. So let me read you one example, and this is from chapter five. <clears throat> and this is the fourth occurrence of the seventh. This is what I have seen to be good. It is fitting to eat and to drink and to find enjoyment in all the toil at which we toil under the sun, the numbered days of the life God gives us. For this is our portion. So these two aspects of the book um, exist in a tension, and the question of overall tonality comes to hinge primarily on how one perceives their relationship to one another and where one places the emphasis. I have chosen chapter nine as a means of reflecting on these tensions. Verses one through 12 of this chapter are the culmination of Kohelet's assertion of the limits that circumscribe and define us as humans. He begins with the rumination on death as the inevitable fate of every human, verses one through six, and ends the section with a rejoinder on the contingent nature of all human effort with incalcul incalculable death, the ultimate contingency. Yet, in between these two reflections resides his most impassioned invitation to live. The force of this passage inheres in this dramatic interplay between shadow and light, death and life, sunlight and the grave. It is a tension woven throughout the book, but which achieves its cogency or most cogent expression here. So moving to um, looking at chapter nine, the translation is white for this, yes. <clears throat> uh, chapters nine through six. The opening verses of chapter nine are in sum a protest against death, in particular, the universality of death. Now the fact that all human endeavor, aspiration, and accomplishment must end in death is in itself a tragedy for Kohelet course, but the universality of death has a particular ramification for this Israelite sage. 
In biblical tradition, and particularly prominent in wisdom tradition, foolishness and wickedness are punished by premature death. Kohelet is intent on examining this principle in light of the fact that everyone dies in the end. Kohelet begins his reflection with a focus on the righteous and the wise in particular. To be in the hand of God in biblical tradition means to be subject to God's power. In positive context, and, and these are the most common, it refers to God's providential care. Certainly, it is the righteous and the wise who may be expected to repose in this safekeeping. And yet, Kohelet probes, just what is the meaning and substance of divine favor in light of undiscriminating death? The same fate comes to everyone. Ultimately, the consequence of living righteously and living without scruples is the same. Kohala laments a world devoid of the recognizable signs of curse and blessing. So verses 1 through 3 are in sum a protest against this irremediable justice, injustice created by the fact of universal death. In the concluding verses to this subsection, Kohelet focuses on the non-sentient state of the dead, the nullity of death. Kohelet is undertaking to impart the unimaginable. Is it possible? The final destination of our existence is non-existence. Our loves, animosities, sorrows, and strivings effaced in a moment. Coelet preempts the suggestion that one can hope for survival in one's legacy or reputation, asserting, as he does elsewhere, that the dead are eventually forgotten. And verse 5b, even the memory of them is lost. As you know, something that is found to be a comfort in, in other biblical tradition. Death is not only the extinction of all those relationships that constitute us as unique, unrepeatable selves. It is the unequivocal end of all potentiality Whatever our aspirations, plans, or hopes, great or modest, they are finished with death. There are no second opportunities beyond the grave. Verse 6b. It is in the wake of this brooding portion of the void of death that Kohelet returns to his theme of enjoyment. The motif, and I want to stress this, is expressed more fully than in any of its previous occurrences. Moreover, the manner in which it is offered is unprecedented. On previous occasions, Kohelet has spoken in the form of commendation, advice to be overheard by the implied audience. Now, he hails his listener directly and in the imperative form. In the immediate context of chapter 9, these rhetorical shifts occur on the very pulse of his summating thoughts on the finality of death. Upon saying, never again a portion in all that happens under the sun, verse 6, Kohelet pivots to address his listener directly. His first word is, go. Inherent in this movement is an awareness that profound certitude about death's finality can be galvanizing. Now looking at this more closely, the themes and language of this, his sixth call to enjoyment are, 
it may be argued, chosen to evoke a particular setting. Eat your bread with joy, enjoins Kohelet, and drink your wine with a merry heart. And by the way, this is the first time we get wine mentioned. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, references to drinking wine with a merry heart occur in the context of feasting, exuberant feasting. Moreover, white garments are the festal attire of the ancient Near East. The practice of anointing the head with oil is likewise connected with feasting and joyful occasions in the Old Testament. Uh, in particular, and we find some passages in Psalms, Proverbs, and Isaiah. Now, in, in Ecclesiastes, the specifications accompanying these two practices, let your garments be white at all times, and oil on your head, let it not be lacking, are in themselves an acknowledgement that such things are normally reserved for feast days. In other words, Kohelet's response to the certainty of coming death is that we should make each day a feast day. In the course of discussing this segment, commentators sometimes quote an intriguing passage from the ancient Mesopotamian epic of Gilgamesh. The passage portrays an encounter between King Gilgamesh and a wise woman, Siduri, who keeps a tavern at the far edge of the earth by the sea. Coming in mid-story, <laughs> Gilgamesh has watched the slow, debilitating death of his most beloved friend and comrade in arms, Inkidu. Grief-stricken and horrified, he has set upon a frantic quest to find the secret of immortality. His plan? To search out the hidden dwelling of the flood hero, Utnapishtim or Noah to us, the one human to have obtained the status of immortal. Encountering Siduri at the low point of his sorrow and terror, he pleads with her for help. Siduri responds thus, on your lavender sheet, Gilgamesh, where are you going? The life you pursue you will not find. When the gods made humankind, death they assigned to humankind, life they kept in their own hands. You, Gilgamesh, let your stomach be full. Enjoy yourself day and night. Make each day a festival. Dance and play day and night. Let your garments be sparkling fresh. Bathe your head, wash yourself in water. Look on the little one holding your hand, and let the wife in your embrace have pleasure time and again. This is the task of humankind. So I read this to you to, for so you can see that Kohelet's words of counsel are rich with the resonances of Siduri's speech to Gilgamesh. Um, there's actually a similarity in the sequence of the themes as they are as they unfold here. Um, indeed, they may be uh, his own um, counsel may be a kind of homage to her sage counsel. Now, while it's not uncommon for Siduri's counsel to be cited in commentary discussions of these verses from Ecclesiastes 9, it is rare that the immediate context of this counsel is brought in. This larger context is illuminating for the tenor of her message to Gilgamesh and helps, I think, to reveal more subtle ways in which Ecclesiastes is redolent with the themes of the myth. 
So looking on, um, I think it's the uh, upper part of your sheet, uh, these are Gilgamesh's, this is Gilgamesh's plea. <laughs> Enkidu, whom I love so dearly, who went with me in all hardships, has now gone to the fate of humankind. Days and nights I wept over him. I would not give him up for burial, as if he might rise up to me again at my cry. <coughs> Seven days and seven nights until decay began to take him. Since his passing, I have not found life. I have roamed like a hunter in the midst of the wild. O oh, tavern keeper, now that I have seen your face, let me not see the death that I ever dread. Now, there are two dimensions to Gilgamesh's anguished state, his bereavement and his own death anxiety. <coughs> that is to say, the experience of Enkidu's death has had a compound effect on him. It is not just that he has suffered the loss <coughs> of a dear one. It is also that through this, he has come to have a taste of what death really is. Up to this point, Gilgamesh has lived by the warrior ethic. Since every man must die, what matters is to have an honorable death against a worthy foe. Thus, one may live on in one's name. But this hero ideology has collapsed in the face of his direct experience of death, of what death really is. It is, for one, final and irrevocable. That is, he cannot bring his loved one back to life by dent of will as he clings to him. And it is quite truly the dissolution of a person depicted in the decay as he clings to him. As for Siduri, it is her task to offer the antidote to Gilgamesh's predicament. And notably, she does not speak to his condition of bereavement, but rather to his death terror and his determined mission to thwart mortality. Her reply is plain, strong medicine. To be human is to die. Immortality is reserved for the gods. Deal with it, says Siduri. Issuing directly from this is her charge to Gilgamesh to fill his stomach, don fresh clothing, and bathe, making each day a celebration. Within the context of the storyline, her exhortation is layered at one level, it bids Gilgamesh put away mourning rites for Enkidu. Yet even more profoundly, it illuminates the significance of accepting death as an implacable boundary. Each day should then be lived to its fullest. What emerges here is that Gilgamesh's refusal to come to terms with inevitable death has also kept him from life. This is in fact poignantly drawn out in Siduri's concluding injunctions, which direct his attention to his loved ones who do remain with him, the little child at his side and his wife. There is a suggestion or implication that Gilgamesh's obsession with eluding ineluctable death has in some sense exiled him from life and all its possibilities in the present. Returning to the text at hand, 
Kohelet has well learned the lessons Siduri offers, and he seeks to impress them upon his readers. In the continuation of his exhortation, he invokes vapor to speak of the boundaries of human existence and their claim on us. It is, in fact, the fleeting nature of one's life, literally life of vapor, that fuels the injunction to eat, drink, celebrate, and enjoy love's companionship. The idea is repeated for emphasis in the Hebrew. This is verse 9. Uh, a component that is not reflected in the NRSV translation. Let me read it to you. Enjoy life with the woman you love all the days of your fleeting life that are given under the sun, all your fleeting days, for that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Kohelet's impassioned behest climaxes in a summons to do, to do what we would with our strength. Already in earlier councils in the book, Kohelet has advocated enjoyment in one's work. Now he goes further, explicitly encouraging his listeners to invest with vigor in the task at hand. The reason for doing such is simply stated. Our inescapable destiny is the vacuum of death. It is, in fact, such a recognition that inspires the passionate challenge of the Greek poet Pindar, uh, the epigram at the top of the lecture. O oh, my soul, do not aspire to immortal life, but exhaust the limits of the possible. Immortality has not been granted to humans. Other things have. When we accept this limit, we are released. Those energies that were siphoned off in the pursuit of that which is not possible may be harm harnessed for that which is. At the beginning of this, his hearty summons to enjoy life's bounty, Kohelet has offered a theological endorsement. This is verse 7 citing divine approval in the matter of human enjoyment. For God has long ago approved what you do. Now the Hebrew word behind NRSV approved not only means to accept or favor, as often noticed, but in fact can mean delight. For instance, it is used of God's joy in God's chosen servant in Isaiah, and of God's pleasure in God's people in the Psalms. In addition, the Hebrew verb bratza has a more specified function in cultic contexts, in that it denotes God's approval of right and appropriate sacrifices. So this latter usage suggests the intriguing possibility that Kohelet intentionally borrows on the theological background of this verb. To configure human enjoyment as quite truly an offering, an offering, an appropriate and pleasing offering to one's God. Moving to the final section, we return, it's an inclusio, the same fate comes to all, verses 9, 11, and 12. Now, many commentators de designate verses 11 and 12 as a separate unit, but these verses resume the theme pondered at the beginning of, of chapter 9, um, with a slight shift. As we've seen, Kohelet has begun by protesting that the righteous and the wise meet the same fate as everyone else. Death levels out all distinctions. In verse 11, Kohelet continues to limit the rift between what we do and are and what befalls us. It's important to discern the nature of Kohelet's grievance here. His complaint is not that the mighty warrior never wins the battle or that the skillful never achieves success. 
his point that there are ample cases in which this does not occur. And for this sage, Kohelet, the exceptions are enough to give him grief. Kohelet laments the fact that there is no assured correlation between the character and abilities of a person and the fate of that person. The reason is that we are, as humans, ever subject to circumstances beyond our control. The runner, the warrior, the wise man are all vulnerable to circumstance. Kohelet asserts that no amount of prowess, physical or intellectual, guarantees successful outcome. With his reference to a person's ignorance of the time of disaster, Kohelet turns to contemplate the misfortune, namely precipitous death. The comparison to the ensnarement of animals is poignant and profoundly expressive of Kohelet's protest. When it comes to the hour of death, the ultimate calamity, humans are no different than all other creatures. Now, what I find intriguing is that Kohelet's stark recognition of the tenuous connection between endeavor and result is directly preceded in verse 10 by that vigorous injunction to dedicate ourselves ardently to whatever we would do. What is the meaning of this in light of his assertion that human ability and endeavor do not necessarily win the day? One might more reasonably expect the sage to counsel a healthy measure of detachment or a more calculated expenditure of effort. Unexpectedly, Kohelet moves in the opposite direction, urging full investment in the task at hand. One of his contradictions are tensions. The move is paradoxical. Kohelet's thinking here is, in fact, more fully explicated in a pivotal passage coming near the end of the book, chapter 11. Read it, I read it to you. In the morning sow your seed, and in the evening do not let your hand be idle, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. There's a, a, t a shifting of tone um, through the book. In other words, Kohelet's surprising response to his close-up and painstaking interrogation of the unpredictable nature of our efforts is that we should give ourselves wholly to them. Who knows? One of them might take root and flourish. Stepping back now um, and looking at chapter 9, the signal theme of the book of Ecclesiastes is human limits, with the consummate limit being that of death. Juxtaposed to Kohelet's many observations on human finitude are his counsels to take hearty enjoyment in life's good things, and we see this contrast peak in chapter 9. Here, Kohelet's meditation on human limits and death has never been so protracted and brooding. At the same time, his invitation to live has never been so emphatic. I have suggested a similar theme is discernible in the Epic of Gilgamesh. These two works share the same preoccupation. Like the Book of Ecclesiastes, the Gilgamesh Epic charts a journey, in this case a literal journey, which is a struggle to come to terms with human mortal status. In exploring one step further, I bring in one more brief speech which is situated at the conclusion of Gilgamesh's quest. With the guidance of the wise tavern keeper, Gil Gilgamesh has been able to cross the sea and gain access to the remote dwelling of the flood hero, Utnapishtim. 
Utnapishtim replies to Gilgamesh's stricken appeal for help with a lengthy poem, which ends with a message similar to that of Siduri. Humans cannot escape death, no exceptions apply. But especially to be noted is the opening of his speech, which responds pointedly to the incessant questioning of Gilgamesh in his attempt to avoid the inevitable. Here, Utnapishtim draws out a particular irony in the situation of the hero. You have toiled without cease. What have you got? Through toil, you wear yourself out. You fill your body with grief. You bring forward the end of your days. The irony is that the denial of death, the, de the defining mark of one's humanity, is life sapping. I turn finally to a source coming from a much later period, the diaries of a young Jewish woman from the Netherlands. These give contemporary testimony to the insights into the human situation found in our two ancient sources. The journals of Esther Hillesom record her experiences in Amsterdam during the time of the Nazi occupation. They are, first and foremost, the private record of the spiritual and intellectual maturing of a gifted young woman, her intense questing for self-knowledge and for understanding of her fellow humans. However, in their oblique reflection, of a young person's dawning awareness of imminent death, the journals embody the themes of the more self-consciously crafted works of Ecclesiastes and the Epic of Gilgamesh. The early entries of the journal um, are from early summer of 1941, and they reflect little of the turbulence belonging to Eddie's external world. However, the increasing hardships and abuses of the occupation gradually begin to impinge on her private world. Her entries during this period of increased hardship poignantly reflect the vacillating moods of optimism, frustration, denial, and anger. The dawning recognition of what this chapter in history portends for her personally is discernible in a fragmented entry from autumn of 1941. Mortal fear in every fiber, complete collapse, lack of self-confidence, aversion, panic. Yet the paralysis and abject terror so palpable in this entry, far from being the last word, mark the beginning of a change. Her writings in the ensuing months evince a gradual shift in perception. As, the, as she struggles to come to terms with this knowledge of her own demise. The culmination of this process is registered in an extraordinary confession of the following summer. Something has crystallized. I have looked our destruction straight in the eye and accepted it into my life. And my love of life has not been diminished. Eddie's direct confrontation with the ultimate limit is, in fact, her liberation from fear. I read further. The reality of death has become a definite 
part of my life. My life has, so to speak, been extended by death, by my looking death in the eye and accepting it, by accepting destruction as part of life and no longer wasting my energies on fear of death or the refusal to acknowledge its inevitability. The capstone to this series of realizations is sparely but eloquently delineated. It sounds paradoxical. By excluding death from our life, we cannot live a full life. And by admitting death into our life, we enlarge and enrich it. The journal covers three more months of Esther's life before she will be moved to a work camp. In this candid, unself-conscious record of daily experience in a time of suffering, alterations of mood do persist. Nonetheless, a perceptible shift in orientation is reflected in the entries of these final weeks. Eddie writes during this period, somewhere there is something that will never desert me again. In addition to this underlying serenity, one discerns a more intense focus on the pleasures of the senses. A joyous reveling in starkly simple experiences of taste, sight, touch, the roundness of an orange, the morning cup of coffee, jasmine on a mud brown wall, bathing in lilac soap. One might venture that the philosophical musings that are more prominent in the earlier part of the diary give way increasingly to an experience of the moment at hand. The encroaching shadow of death, rather than crowding out all else, brings into relief the delicate shimmer of the small daily gifts of life. The Epic of Gilgamesh and the Journal of Esther Hillison, divided by some three millennia, evince similar responses to the fact of mortality. Death is our inescapable human destiny. The denial of its reality vitiates life, and coming to terms with it makes living possible. Siduri's eloquent response to Gilgamesh, the questing hero, warrants one last look. In her summation, she refers to the activity she has described as the task of humanity. I would suggest that these words harken back to her initial assertion. When the gods made humans, they kept one destiny for themselves and assigned humans another. Thus, uh, Siduri's ensuing call to Gilgamesh to feast, to celebrate, to love um, with compassion and affection becomes, in effect, an amplification on mortal status. This is the task of humankind. Gilgamesh has wished to transcend his mortal nature. In response, Siduri assures him he cannot, but she points out those other things that also belong to that status. In seeking to avoid death, the defining mark of humanity, Gilgamesh has also missed out on those goods that are the distinct mark of humanness. Though Kohelet may not voice his response to death, in so positive a fashion? I would maintain that these three works, Gilgamesh, Ecclesiastes, and Esther Hillison's journals, are on a continuum of thought. 
Would Kohelet say that, I admit, that by admitting death into our life, we enlarge and enrich it? Perhaps not. Yet what reaches distinct articulation in the writings of Eddie Hillison germinates in the contemplations of this author. I close with a poem from Jane Kenyon, published a year after her death from leukemia. The poem is entitled, Otherwise. I got out of bed on two strong legs. It might have been otherwise. I ate cereal, sweet milk, ripe, flawless peach. It might have been otherwise. I took the dog uphill to the birchwood. All morning I did the work I love. At noon I lay down with my mate. It might have been otherwise. We ate dinner together at a table with silver candlesticks. It might have been otherwise. I slept in a bed in a room with paintings on the walls and planned another day, just like this day. But one day, I know it will be otherwise. Kohelet is ever cognizant of the otherwise that shadows our lives. The value of this heightened awareness of our terminality lies in its potential to revive us and thus to refocus our attention on ordinary pleasures, the riches of the familiar and the near to hand, the simplest gifts of life. Our assignment, so to speak, is only to be able to recognize and fully savor such moments when they come to us. Be it a shared meal with silver candlesticks or simply a well-brewed cup of tea, the author of this book invites us to live each such moment to its deepest core. This is the wisdom of Kohelet. Thank you very much, Dr. Duncan. We have time for a couple of questions now. Comments? That was really good. Yeah. Is enough time? Yeah, we have time for two. Yeah. Um, yes. I appreciate um, hearing you because I think this is my first time listening into your lecture and I really learned a lot. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and just also the first time realizing how much Ecclesiastes really resonate with Buddhism. With I, I, Buddhism. Yes. So I never really put those two together before until today. Yes. So thank you so much. Marcus so Borg, in um, his book on reading the Bible again for a second time, I always get it wrong, yes. speaks of this oh, okay. in his discussion of Ecclesiastes. Mm -hmm. So, and interesting. Yeah. You read it? Mm -hmm. So I've often been struck by. Uh, by those who, who study evangelism and who write about it and practice it, that there is a tendency to be rather dour in how they present the work of evangelism and, and missional work. And, and I'm also struck, and I realize this is just a, a matter of, of words, but that the go, do this, sounds a lot like Jesus in the Great Commission, go therefore into all the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's been any work that's ever been done, um, in biblical studies at least, because I haven't seen it in evangelism or missiology, around uh, trying to weave together the notion of what does it mean to go and rejoice and enjoy the life God has given you even as one goes out in mission to reach out to others? Hmm. I feel as if I should know something, but I don't. Um, well, I, I likewise, so that's yeah, all right. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. But it's just. But it's an interesting thing to reflect on. I feel like there must be something. 
Yeah, I, I haven't seen it before, but I was curious because yeah. that, that caught me there. And uh -huh. I, it just seems like in some ways there's – I've often thought that if, if Charles Dickens and John Wesley were to meet, that <laughs> in, in some ways it would be a matter of, of the Great Commission meets what you're saying here about oh, Ecclesiastes. Uh, because huh. Dickens was much happier than Wesley was in lots of ways. <laughs> and so I, I think that that's, it, it would just be interesting to see how the, the sort of the ethics and, and the commandments of each yes. come together. So yeah. something to consider in the future yeah. uh -huh. for both of us. Thank you. It's time for one more? Oh, yeah. Um, thank you, Julie, for a fabulous lecture, comment, and a question. I am stunned by the depth of what you've been involved in for years Thank and you. years. You have given years of your life to this commentary. And, uh, I have, and it's, it's right at the crossroads of the deepest, most difficult things that we struggle with as human beings. So I want to ask you, and I don't know if you can speak to it or not, I want to ask you something about what it's been like for you to abide in this place with these questions so front and center mm. for the number of years you've been working on this? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, wow, what a question. <laughs> as, as you know, whenever we work on anything a long time, we almost can start to forget its secrets and its wonders. But the beautiful thing about what's going on in this book is there are sort of reminders all around us that catch you off guard and you say, ah, that's Kohelet. That's what he's saying. Um, you know, scenes in a movie or the scene in a movie, the way it will capture something, a line in poetry. So um, it's the good has outweighed the suffering. <laughs> Um, and, and I think in the end, um, it, it has, it has opened my eyes to, um, levels of experience, um, that I feel like are so easily, you know, the small things, as I said, that are so easily just passed over in each day. Um, so, Ultimately, it's been able, in, in its best moments, to cultivate a gratitude, um, just a deep gratitude for so many small things, you know, right down to Dove Dark Chocolate. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, so thank you very much. To piggyback on your question <coughs> and make a comment, um, I have sat in uh, Dr. Duncan's class all semester. And I can tell you from my experience that this work enlivens what she does here at the seminary for all of us. Um, it was an absolute joy to sit in that class all semester as difficult a material as it was, the Old Testament. So I think, I don't know if you're consciously aware of how much of that appreciation of life, joy, of the small things that you touch in the classroom, of the comments oh. that you, <laughs> but um, I think this work helps uh, all of us, and I've been one to experience the results. Thank oh. you. Thank you so much. <coughs> so with that, we are going to uh, <laughs> call it a day. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Duncan. <laughs>